our life sustainer, deliverer, our comfort and joy. Throughout the ages, you've been our shelter, our peace in the midst of the storm. With signs and wonders, you've shown your power. With precious blood, you showed us your grace. You've been our helper, our liberator, the giver of life with no end. We will remember, we will remember, we will remember the works of your hand. Stop and give you praise for great is thy faithfulness. When we walk through life's darkest valleys, we will look back at all you have done, and we will shout, Our God is good, and He is the faithful one. Hallelujah, hallelujah to the one from whom all blessings flow. Hallelujah, hallelujah to the one whose glory has been shown. Great is thy faithfulness. I still remember the day you saved me, the day I heard you call out my name. You said you loved me and would never leave me, and I've never been the same. We will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise, for great is thy faithfulness. We will remember, we will remember. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's 
Anytime the gospel stirs a surging soul And someone says, send me, here I go
thank you, choir, for starting us out on that positive note. That song was, had a lot to say about praising our Savior, and that's the prayer of our hearts tonight, that He gets the praise and the glory by everything said, sung, and done tonight in the service. I'd like to welcome all of you out to our youth service tonight, and pray that we will all leave blessed, challenged, encouraged, or whatever the Lord um, gives to us tonight. All right, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for just this opportunity to, to come out tonight and to be able to gather with our fellow um, church and, and to be able to sing praises to your name and, and just to be able to come out and, and hear from you, dear Lord. We know that we have a blessing in this country to be able to do this, and, and we thank you for it. And we just pray that uh, it'll continue to be so. Dear Lord, we pray uh, for Nate tonight as he gets up. Pray that you will use him in a special way. Um, pray that he'll be your mouthpiece tonight, and every heart in here tonight will either be encouraged or, or blessed or maybe even challenged, dear Lord. And dear Lord, we, we just sing your praises tonight and pray that you get the praise and the glory and everything said, sung, and done. In Jesus' name, amen. Right now, y'all can sit back, relax a little bit longer, and we're going to be favored with a solo, Bury the Workman, and the choir will come with their last piece, 10,000 Reasons. Stephen was a deacon in Jerusalem. They dragged him out those city gates to try and quiet him. When Stephen preached, those Pharisees started throwing stones. Before he died, he raised his eyes and saw Jesus on the throne. Said, you can bury the workmen, but the work will go on. And you can silence the voices, but you can't stop the song. When the Spirit's moving, His will will be done. And you can bury the workmen, but the work will go on. James was sent to heaven by the edge of Herod's sword. And Peter, he was crucified like his beloved Lord. The Roman Colosseum, the lions and the fires. The gates of hell did not prevail. They fanned those flames higher, cause you can bury the workmen, but the work will go on. And you can't silence the voices, but you can't stop the song. When the spirits move in, this will will be done. And you can marry the workmen, but the work will go on. And then they lowered Jesus, they laid him in a grave. They thought that it was over, that his name would fade away. But Jesus wasn't listening, no, he rose to life again. Cause God is not persuaded by the arrogance of men. So you can bury the workmen, but the work will go on. And you can silence the voices, but you can't stop the song. When the spirits move in, this will will be done. And you can bury the workmen, but the work will you can bury the workmen, but the work will go on.
As we have tonight's uh, meeting, uh, I was praying about what to share, and I have to say that there was a bit of a, a ping pong situation in my mind between uh, two different things that were on my heart. But I returned to something I've been meditating on, and it's been really for the last couple of years, but I believe that it's, it's meant for this evening for certain ones of you. I trust it'll be an encouragement and edification for everyone, but I've been thinking a lot about the will of God. Just a lot about the will of God. Now, I have to say a little disclaimer. When I talk about this specific topic, there will be a temptation for some of you to think it's aimed at the young people. But let me encourage you that if you think this message is for someone else, it's most likely for you. Uh, the topic would typically be called finding the will of God. But if you think about finding the will of God, we might find somebody who's slightly older, I'm not saying you're that old, Cassidy, but like slightly older than what would be perceived as young people. And you could say, well, I've already found the will of God. Like, and and what, what I mean is you're interpreting it saying, this is what I'm doing in life. That is not what I mean. If, I, if you think I'm talking about career, that's not what I'm referring to. You see, the will of God is not some stagnant thing you find and then you move on. The will of God is something you live in daily and moment by moment. So I have encouragement for you. You get the opportunity as much to find and live in the will of God as that little guy right there. And so please understand this message is absolutely for all of us. But as we think about finding the will of God, we tend to add a little phrase, and I think this phrase is very dangerous, and I just want to caution against it. Oftentimes we say, I want to find the will of God for my life. And I really want to just encourage you that that's really not the point. The point is not to find the will of God for your life. The point is to find the will of God, period. Because if you find the will of God, you're going to find where you get to walk. And I'll explain what I mean. Cars nowadays have this feature, and we rent cars very often as we travel, so we drive a lot of random vehicles, whatever basically the rental car company gives us. And though we book the cheap car, sometimes they give us very uh, nice cars. This last week, we had a Mustang. I've never driven a Mustang. You might think that's exciting. For me, I have a little baby. Try putting a car seat in the back of a Mustang. 
Not convenient. I hope they never give me a Mustang again. And some of you are like, man, give me your car. I just got the cheap one, and I thought it was four-door. It was not. But anyway, all that to say is a lot of cars have a feature, which I, I, at first when I got it, I, I didn't like it. I still don't really like the feature, but, uh, but at least I'm used to it. It's this thing where as you drive, if you hit the white line, you know what it does? It buzzes on your seat. You get like this vibration in your rear end. It's very strange. The first time it happens, you're like, why, why is this happening to me? And then you start to realize, and then it kind of becomes a game either to avoid it or just provoke it. Uh, but that being said, as you drive, if you hit the white line or the middle of the road, your seat just buzzes. And it kind of lets you know you're getting off track. Well, this is a, a, a kind of a vivid illustration, I think, for all of us, because as we drive this road of life, if we know the will of God, the Holy Spirit gives us these nice buzzes. He, he lets us know through conviction, saying, you're not walking in my will. You're not walking the way that I want you to. And, and here's my encouragement for you tonight. We're going to talk about the will of God, but more specifically, I'm going to come through the back door, and I want to talk about the things that get us off the will of God. And you'll understand what I mean here in just a bit. So let's talk about the will of God. Because the will of God, again, like I said before, it's a very distinct place. And it's a place that daily we get to choose to live in. As we think about the will of God, let's just start out by recognizing four things that are God's will, period. Now, when I say these things, please understand, you don't need to pray about, is this God's will? Again, if God's already said it, I think it's quite arrogant of us, and I also think it's uh, quite disobedient of us to keep asking him, is this your will, is this your will, is this your will? If God's already said something is, is his will, can we just agree it's his will? So what is God's will? Well, let's start out in 1 Peter. 1 Peter. And as you head over to 1 Peter, find chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We come down to verse 9. And it says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing or not willing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. Not willing that any should perish. See, the first thing I know about God's will is this. I know that God wants every soul to be saved. I don't have to wonder, oh, does God want that person saved or that person saved? I know absolutely without any doubt when I look at you that God wants you to be saved. That means that I also know something else about you. I know value. I know that Jesus Christ died for your sin. That's powerful. That means right away, if I am walking in the will of God, and I say if I am because there are certainly times that Nate Bramson does not walk in the will of God. And what do I mean by that? I look at somebody, and I don't see their need to be saved. They're just, frankly, annoying me. I don't care about them. In fact, I find that they're in my way instead of actually looking at them as a soul for whom Christ died. I say that to my chagrin. I say that completely. I am in the wrong. But oftentimes, I don't walk in the will of God when I look at a soul and I don't think of their salvation. I think simply of how they are deterring my ambition for the moment. But the first thing I absolutely know is that God wants every soul to be saved. We don't need to wonder. We don't need to pray about, hey, is this guy supposed to be saved? The Lord wants him saved. That's the first thing I know. Let's keep moving, though, because we want to get to the second part of the message. So four things here. The second thing I absolutely know Without any doubt, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Here's the second thing that I know is God's will. Don't need to pray about it. This is God's will without any doubt. Ephesians chapter 5. And let's uh, begin reading in verse uh, 15. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Okay, listen. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He's saying this is God's will. Understand it. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with with the Spirit. And then it goes on to describe it, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord 
with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The second thing we know, first of all, if it's salvation, the second word is spirit, that we are to be filled with the spirit of God. This is a constant filling. Yes, we've been given the spirit of God at salvation, but there's a constant filling. One thing you have to understand, though, if something is full, what you understand is the fact that there's no room for anything else. If something, by definition, is full, it's simply full. If a class is full, you would say, well, you can't get somebody else in it. If so, you can get someone else in it. It's not full yet. If a glass is full, you can't put anything else in it. It's full. So what's it saying? Be filled with the Spirit of God. And it gives us examples of things that get in the way of being filled with the Spirit of God. And so we know that God wants us to be controlled, absolutely filled with His Spirit. We have the Spirit, and the Spirit wants to fill us, but oftentimes we are allowing other things in our life that fill us. And if we're filled, if we have other things in our life that are filling us, by definition, we're not filled with the Spirit because there are other things in our life that are taking that place. Just understand, again, I'm not going into this tonight. I just want you to understand that is the will of God that you be filled with His Spirit moment by moment by moment. But there are two other things I want to mention that are always God's will. That we be saved, that we be filled with the Spirit. The third S we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, now watch out. This is a, a young people's meeting, right, uh, uh, by, by at least uh, title. This next one, please understand what you're about to read is not something to pray about. It's not something to debate. And listen, it is not something to explain away. And I believe there are some in this room that you have not just gotten buzzed by hitting the side of the road. You just decide, I'm going to go off the road. And you have completely rejected the authority of God in your life. And you know who you are. You've completely rejected the authority of God in your life. Do not, do not ask God for his will in your life. When you are choosing to stop even listening to him. It might be some of you older people. Might not be a younger person. Are you ready for this? First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm just saying, if God's already said something and it is his will, how absolutely arrogant is it of me to say, God, what's your will for me? When he said his will, and I'm saying, God, let me just spit in your face a little bit. Now, what's your will? Verse 3. For this is the will of God. Is that kind of an obvious start? God says, for this is the will of God. What is it? Your sanctification. You say, okay, that's a very spiritual term that is ambiguous. No, no, let, let's be more specific. Verse 4, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. It is the will of God that you flee sexual immorality. Hang on, hang on. God's not saying it's his will that you simply look clean from the outside. He didn't say it's his will that somehow you sort of maintain a semblance of holiness says it's his will that you run, run from, run, run. Wait, wait, did you, I don't think it's getting across. Run. You see any hint of sexual immorality? Run. In what you watch, run. What you hear, run. Relationships, run, run, run. Is this clear or do I need to say run some more? Do you want to know the will of God? Stop asking him the will for your life if you are not running from sexual immorality. Run, run, run. You say you're saying the same thing. Well, then why are we living the same way day in and day out? And we have the audacity to say, God, what's your will for my life? And we don't run. Stop asking him. He's already told you. This is the will of God for you. Run. There's a fourth thing. 
You might say it's a cop-out, but it's in the Word of God. And I'm just going to keep it really simple. If we have three S's so far, he wants you saved. He wants you spirit-filled. He wants you sanctified. By the way, I got good news for you. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be sanctified fully one day. Our brother Ross was just sanctified fully. When we see him, it says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, when we see him, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. Therefore, whoever has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. I love that. You know, it also tells me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that Christ is my sanctification. He's my identity. When I stand before him, I am fully holy because I'm in Christ. I love that. But how will the world know if they look at me and see Nate Bramson instead of Jesus Christ? We are to reflect him. And how do we reflect him? Through a journey of sanctification. But the fourth thing, the fourth thing, we could go to a lot of passages, but let me just give it to you very fast, and uh, that way we can go to these other elements that we want to discuss. But the fourth thing is this, the Word of God. The Word of God, so the Scriptures. The fourth thing for God's will is the Scriptures. If he said it in the Bible, he meant it. If he said it in here, you don't need to pray about it. You see, oftentimes we want to know the will of God, but the question is, are we walking in the Word of God? If we're walking in the Word of God, then we clearly will know the will of God. Now, the will of God might not be something as specific as, I want you to go to road number 19, but it will be, love your neighbor as yourself. It will have things like, forgive others as I've forgiven you. It will be, be slow to wrath. It will be, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. There was a guy named Vito Mitty. Don't know much about him, but I do know a few things. One, he was a, a philosophy student in Spain, in Barcelona. Now, he at one point went to uh, a library, and he was, uh, I don't even know how he found this book, but he saw an archaic section of the library, and he picked up a book of an old philosopher. Now, this philosopher, frankly, uh, it wasn't known by, by many people, apparently, I and mean, you'll know that by the end of the story, because as he read this guy's philosophy book, he came to this little leaflet that had been inserted in the book. He pulled out the leaflet, and this is what it said. It says, my will is bequeathed to whoever reads this book. Wait, wait, do you get that? My will is bequeathed to whoever reads this book. Hey, and, and he said, well, hang on a second. It looked like a legal document. And so he took it to the courts in Spain. And sure enough, it was. He got 250,000 euros. That's about $300,000. All because he found a little leaflet in a book. That's like winning the lottery. Except, except I got something better. I have a leaflet in my Bible, too, that says, my will is bequeathed to whoever reads this book. Literally, the will of the Almighty God is mine. If only I would read this book. You see, the things that it says in it, things like every blessing in spiritual places is mine. The fact that I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The fact that I've been redeemed by his blood. The fact that he's my heavenly father, and it says an earthly father. I got a little girl, right? And, and she doesn't talk. You know, she talks, but she doesn't say words I understand yet. Uh, but, but it says, what father, if their, if their child asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? Like, if you as earthly fathers know how to give good things... How much more me as a heavenly father? I mean, yes, this is the character of God. See, I know his will, and his will is not just do this and do that. It's I'm your father in heaven. I love you. What a privilege we have to walk with him. His will is bequeathed to us. And so the fourth thing you don't need to pray about is if you read it in the Bible, just do it. Nike had it right about that, just about the wrong source. Just do it. You say, but I don't understand exactly what it means. Well, then, with the faith God's given you and the understanding he has, obey it to that degree. Why are we waiting to understand it fully? If you're going to understand it fully, you'll never obey God. He says, my ways are above your ways. My thoughts are above your thoughts. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And we know that from Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And so, now I want us to get to the harder part of tonight, because now we have to actually deal with our own lives. That's the will of God, no question about it. There's no debating that. You can take those things up with God if you want, but you'll lose, because it's his will. And, and last time I checked, and forever as long as I check, there's... The word in Hebrews 13 that says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and he'll change tomorrow? No. <laughs> yesterday, today, and forever. So if that was his will yesterday, don't worry. It's still his will today. But with that said, I want to ask you guys some questions.
questions. Here's a little list. I want us just, I'm just going to name a few. I have many more than I'm going to name, but I pray the Holy Spirit will guide me in which ones I do name. I want to name some stuff that gets in the way of you even listening to the will of God in your life. What are the things that keep you? In fact, you could say this part of the message is called how to guarantee you will not walk in the will of God. Positive, I know. So the first thing is this. The word sentiments, sentiments, it's also the word for feelings, but these will all start with an S, so hopefully we can remember. Now, as I name these, I want you to think of one that's true in your life, one. As you leave here, take one. I'll name maybe five, seven, ten, I don't know, in, in the next 15 minutes, but just take one. Sentiments, what do I mean? Feelings, how you feel. Let me just say this. I'm going to say it simply, all right, and very clearly. Your feelings have nothing to do with you obeying God's will. Got that? Whoa, I'm going to say it again, because it sure is a big deal. I just don't feel like her. That's just not me. Your feelings have nothing to do with obeying the will of God. Nothing, not even a little bit. Nothing at all. You think Jesus Christ really felt like dying for you? He actually prayed before he went to the cross, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Your feelings have nothing, nothing, nothing to do with obedience. In fact, God never said, hey, I, I, want you to feel, I want you to feel good about following me. He says, actually, take up your cross, follow me. Take up your cross indicates you're on your way to die. Please, I believe there are many that do not walk in the will of God all because of some feelings. That's the whole thing about this is the will of God, run from sexual morality. I mean, where are the feelings in that situation? Let me tell you, with the sin. I want to encourage you. You say, my feelings aren't lining up. That's okay. They never had to in the first place. In fact, I believe that is one of the greatest reasons we suffer for the name of Christ. You might imagine suffering being like those men on the shores of Libya who got their heads cut off by ISIS. Yeah, that's suffering too. But let me tell you, when you choose to obey the word of God and it goes against your flesh, you will suffer as 1 Peter chapter 4 clearly indicates. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. If you're going to cease from sin, you're going to suffer in the flesh. I encourage you. Sentiments. Are they in the way today of you obeying God's will for your life? Maybe that's your S. But let's go on to the next one. Let's give some other options to take out of here. How about this? Shame. I won't mention it very long, but shame. In other words, something may be in your past, and you know that God's telling you to move forward, but you're holding on to something that he already let go of because he forgave you at Calvary. Is there shame in your life that you're still looking at and, and you're saying, that's who you are? I deal with this. I, well, there are times that I know I disobey the Lord and I confess my sin. I still feel shame. And many times, I, I, I'm just telling you straightforward, I, I don't move forward when he wants me to move forward because I just linger in how messed up I am. And the Lord's saying, hang on, I know you're messed up. I always knew you were messed up. That's why I came to save you. Now, live in my identity. You're in Christ. Shame. How about this one? It's kind of the opposite. Success. Some of us just stay in our successful state where we say, well, you know, uh, I've, uh, I've done so much already. I feel like I've done my part. I mean, I look at the person next to me. I've done more than them. So, you know what? Based off of what I've done in my resume before God, I, I think I can kind of coast a little bit. If any of you are coasting today, let me tell you, you're living in disobedience because today is a day of obedience. I want to encourage you, don't live in past success, live in present faithfulness. How about this one? This one's a simple but very profound, situations. We have many situations in this room. We have some people dealing with deep situations of loss and hurt and sorrow. But your situation is your platform for God's glory. Some of you all have situations of maybe a health problem, maybe cancer. I don't know what it is. But do you allow your situation to be an excuse for not fully obeying God? Because it was God's shock, like, oh, my, <laughs> I didn't know that was going to be your situation. Woo, okay, I, I understand. You don't, no, 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 no. You, you, you don't need to obey the Bible anymore because, like, your situation excludes you because I didn't, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> you say, that's dumb. Obviously, God knew what was coming. Yeah, obviously, God knew what was coming. Is your situation something that shocked God? No. He knows. He cares. He loves you more than you love yourself. Your situation could be an excuse, but before God, it doesn't count. Because God actually has your days numbered, and he knows. 
He knows what's best. Situation. Let's throw out a few more because I still see that I've got 10 minutes, so we're going to go until the time runs out. Here's another one. <laughs> this might sound strange, but please listen. This is maybe the most complicated one. Solutions. You might say, wait, solutions keep me from obeying God's will. What I mean is we have solutions for our life, but really we're asking the wrong question. It's like we have the right answer to our question, but we're not really asking the right question in life, period. In other words, it might be something to the degree of how can I make the most of myself? How can I make the most of my talents? How can I, how can I better? And all of a sudden what we do is we start to find good solutions for our life, but we're actually missing the entire point of life, the glory of God. I just wonder if some of you really seem to have your life straight. Let me talk to the young people for a second here. Like, people look at you and they say, man, you got it going on. Like, you got things in order. You got solutions. You know where you're headed. I think that's one of the most dangerous things for young people that think they have their life planned out. Whenever I know somebody who tells me, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do that. Now, I don't necessarily say it to them right off the bat, but I'm thinking, Lord, wreck this person's life. You say, you're weird. That's what I pray. Because if you think you got your life planned out, my friends, you are no longer looking at the Lord. You are looking at your plans. He says, his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. A lamp to my feet shows me the next step. It's not a floodlight to show me the whole way. I've got to walk looking at the Lord. Do you have solutions that are getting in the way of the will of God in your life? Solutions. How about this one? Support. <laughs> support. What do I mean by support? I'll tell you very simply what I mean. Sometimes God says things in his word that he says, this is my will. And guess what? The people closest to you will not support you because it's not the norm. They say that's too radical. Oh, God's called me to go to Myanmar and serve. Oh, no, 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 no. You can't leave the island. Sometimes obedience. How, how about this? Uh, this has been a very personal one. Uh, there are times that the Lord has just told me, you need to forgive that person. And people very close to me that have been hurt by that person say, no, don't, don't have anything to do with them. Godly people. I say, but, but, but the word of God tells me to forgive. They've repented. And see, sometimes even relationships of life can be hurt when you walk in obedience to the will of God. Are you waiting for everybody to agree with your decision before you obey the Lord? If the Lord's called you to do something, this is not about popular vote. This is not about an electoral college. This is not about some kind of, uh, oh, I hope everyone goes along with me. The question is, are you walking in the word? If you're walking in the word, that's when you act. Support. Are you waiting for someone's support when you already have the Lord's command? Next question, or the next one. Safety, safety. Now, I won't go into this one very long, but certainly we could talk about it quite a bit. If the Lord says, take up your cross and follow me, the journey was never meant to be safe. Isn't that pretty obvious? The Lord doesn't call you to safety. And let me tell you this, too. He doesn't call you to a long life. He might give you a long life, but he doesn't call you to a long life. He calls you to obedience. Let me ask you, does safety have anything to do with you obeying the Lord? If it does, I encourage you. Safety might be the thing buzzing you on the side saying, drop that, get back to obedience. It's not safe to walk with Jesus Christ, because if he says, follow me, and he's on his way to Calvary, you know where you're going. Next thing is this, skills, skills. See, when you read the word of God, do you ever think, oh, wow, that's powerful, but I can't do that. <laughs> hey, wait, would the Lord ask you to do something that you can't do? Well, he'll ask you something you can't do in your flesh, but... That's the beauty of his power. When is your strength made perfect? When you're strong? No, when you're weak. That's when his strength's made perfect. Some of you have been stripped of things that you would have said are your strength. You're really weak right now. I got good news for you. You're in a place of great strength because that is where the world will see Christ and not you. Are you waiting for your skills to match up? Stop. If his word says so, go forward knowing that his strength will meet you in that place of obedience. The next thing is this, significance. I just wonder, are you seeing something that God says to do and you say, I, I know God says to do that, but it's just not a big deal. Like it, it's, no one's gonna notice. It's, not, it's like that holiness behind closed doors. Maybe it's at home. Maybe it's with your parents and the way you talk back to them, it just does not honor them. And you say, well, that's just a minor thing. God, what do you want me to do in life? 
the most significant thing you can do today is obey the word of God at face value. If he says, honor your father and your mother, honor your father and your mother. If he says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. If he says, forgive others as I have forgiven you, forgive others as you have been forgiven. It's just straight out. It's like not complicated. Walk in the truth that you know. And as you do, I guarantee you one thing. He will continue to guide you in truth. The will of God is not dependent on what you view as significant. All right, I'm going to have to pick about two more because I'm going to be out of time. And I'm going to stop on time. All right, next thing. Uh, let's go with this. Oh, this is a tough one. Stuff. Stuff. I know. It doesn't sound very theological, right? But stuff. How often do things take the place of us unrelenting, unimpeded, or without impediment, follow the Lord? Are there things in your life that you just have to hold on to? Things that if, if God, if you have to relinquish that, well, then it's just not worth it anymore. I wonder, does stuff get in the way? It's interesting because Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, what was their sin? Well, if I pulled the audience of Christians and I said, what's the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Most Christians will say something to do with homosexuality. That's not what God said. Now, yeah, it was there, but that was a root of many, that was a, a product of other things. It says very clearly in Ezekiel 16 that the sins of Sodom were these. They were proud. They had excess food and prosperous ease. Oh, yeah, and they didn't help the poor and needy. That's the sins of Sodom at least according to the Bible. And so why do I say it like that? Well, I say it because I think we have those things in our life too. And stuff, things, material possessions can oftentimes get in the way of simply say, I'm going to obey regardless of the cost. All right, in the two and a half minutes left, let me throw this out. This one, I'm going to give you the two, one that's on my heart because it's really the thing I'm struggling with and this one. The next one I'll say is this, sleep, sleep. You might say, are you serious, sleep? Well, I'm using the word sleep, but let me just put this in there as a, as a synonym, laziness, laziness. Some of us simply are lazy. We know what God said, but we're lazy. We know he's told us to act and move forward, but we're lazy. Go to the ant, you sluggard. That's what the word of God would say in Proverbs chapter six. Are we lazy in the work of the Lord? We know that, that he wants all souls to be saved. We know that he desires men to know. And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall one preach unless he is sent? John 17, so send I you as a father has sent me. Go into all the world. The final one I'm going to say is this. And this is the one that I'm telling you is my number. The word schedule. Schedule. It might not be yours, but for me, my schedule gets in the way of the will of God. I have my schedule planned out. Really, I have it planned out about two years in advance. You ask me what I'm doing six months and nine days from now, I can tell you. Is that good? You might say, whoa, it's not, I, I, it's not bad to have plans. But it's a tragedy when my plans supersede moment-by-moment moment dependence on the voice of God. I wonder if our plans, what we plan to do, gets in the way of that still small voice saying, hang on, did you not notice that person right across the street from you that needed a ride? Did you not notice that dear sister that's discouraged and needed a hug? Did you not notice that individual over there that has almost nothing and they needed some food today? I was too busy on my schedule. I was plowing forward. I just encourage you, you want to live in the will of God? You know the will of God. It's very clear. Stop making the will of God a mystical thing that seems unattainable and seems confusing, when in reality, God's will is straightforward. He's given us his love letter. He's told us his heart. He says, walk in it. I love you. I'm for you. And therefore, this is my will. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me, my father will love, I will love, and I will manifest myself to him. John 14, 21. That's my prayer for you. And if you thought I was preaching at you, I was really talking to myself. These are the things that I have to be constantly reminded of. Because I truly desire, as I stand before him one day to hear, well done. 
Well done, my good and faithful servant. You knew my will, and you walked in it. That's faithfulness. Let's close in prayer. Father, these things we've heard. This was not new, but we need to hear them again and again because it's so easy for us to drive down the road of life and feel that little buzz of conviction and just say, you know, I'm just going to keep going. (laughs) If I go far enough, that buzz will stop. (laughs) If I go fully off the line, I don't have to deal with conviction anymore. And Lord, I believe many of us grow numb. We grow numb to your voice. We grow content with where we're at. We grow complacent with the lostness around us. And we compromise with sin, which so easily ensnares us. Father, my prayer today for myself and for my precious sisters and brothers in this room is that we, that we would know your will and do it. Not because we understand why you're asking us, but because we know who is asking us, and we know you are worthy. So, Lord God, we commit ourselves to you, and I pray if anything was said not guided by you, take it from our hearts, but whatever is of you, embed it on our hearts that we might be changed for the sake of your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.